This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Four Million by O. Henry. Chapter 3 The Cosmopolite in a Cafe. At midnight the café was crowded. By some chance the little table at which I sat had escaped the eye of incomers, and two vacant chairs at it extended their arms with venal hospitality to the influx of patrons. And then a cosmopolite sat in one of them, and I was glad, for I held a theory that since Adam no true citizen of the world has existed. We hear of them, and we see foreign labels on much luggage but we find travellers instead of cosmopolites. I invoke your consideration of the scene, the marble top tables, the range of leather upholstered wall seats, the gay company, the ladies dressed in demi-state toilettes, speaking in an exquisite visible chorus of taste, economy, opulence, or art, the sedulous and largesse-loving garçon, the music wisely catering to all with its raids upon the composers, the melange of talk and laughter, and, if you will, the Wurzburger in the tall glass cones that bend to your lips as a ripe cherry sways on its branch to the beak of a robber jay. I was told by a sculptor from Mouch Chunk that the scene was truly Parisienne. My cosmopolite was named E. Rushmore Coglin, and he will be heard from next summer at Coney Island. He is to establish a new attraction there, he informed me, offering kingly diversion. Then his conversation rang along parallels of latitude and longitude. He took the great round world in his hand, so to speak, familiarly, contemptuously, and it seemed no longer than the seed of a maraschino cherry in a table d'hote grapefruit. He spoke disrespectfully of the equator. He skipped from continent to continent. He derided the zones. He mopped up the high seas with his napkin. With a wave of his hand he would speak of a certain bazaar in Hyderabad. Whiff! He would have you on skis in Lapland. Zip! Now you rode the breakers with the Kanakas at Kielaka Kiki. Presto! He dragged you through an Arkansas post-oak swamp, let you drive for a moment on the alkali plains of his Idaho ranch then whirled you into the society of Viennese archdukes. Anon he would be telling you of a cold he acquired in a Chicago lake breeze, and how old S. Camilla cured it in Buenos Aires with a hot infusion of the chuchula weed. You would have addressed a letter to E. Rushmore Coglin, Esquire, the Earth, Solar System, the Universe, and have mailed it, feeling confident that it would be delivered to him. I was sure that I had found at last the one true cosmopolite since Adam, and I listened to his worldwide discourse, fearful lest I should discover in it the local note of the mere globe-trotter. But his opinions never fluttered or drooped. He was as impartial to cities, countries, and continents as the winds or gravitation. And as E. Rushmore Coglin prattled of this little planet, I thought with glee of a great, almost cosmopolite who wrote for the whole world and dictated himself to Bombay. In a poem he has to say that there is pride and rivalry between the cities of the earth, and that the men that breathe from them they traffic up and down, but cling to their city's hem as a child to the mother's gown. And whenever they walk by roaring streets unknown, they remember their native city, most faithful, foolish, fond, making her mere breath name their bond upon their bond. And my glee was roused because I had caught Mr. Kipling napping. Here I had found a man, not made from dust, one who had no narrow boasts of birthplace or country, one who, if he bragged at all, would brag of the whole round globe against the Martians and the inhabitants of the moon. Expression on these subjects was precipitated by E. Rushmore Coglin by the third corner to our table. While Coglin was describing to me the topography along the Siberian railway, the orchestra glided into a medley. The concluding air was Dixie, 
and as the exhilarating notes tumbled forth they were almost overpowered by a great clapping of hands from almost every table. It is worth a paragraph to say that this remarkable scene can be witnessed every evening in numerous cafés in the city of New York. Tons of brew have been consumed over theories to account for it. Some have conjectured hastily that all southerners in town hie themselves to cafés at nightfall. This applause of the rebel air in a northern city does puzzle a little, but it is not insolvable. The war with Spain, many years' generous mint and watermelon crops, a few long-shot winners at the New Orleans racetrack, and the brilliant banquets given by the Indiana and Kansas citizens who compose the North Carolina Society have made the South rather a fad in Manhattan. Your manicure will lisp softly that your left forefinger reminds her so much of a gentleman in Richmond, V.A. Oh, certainly, but many a lady has to work now. The war, you know. When Dixie was being played, a dark-haired young man sprang up from somewhere with a Mosby gorilla yell and waved frantically his soft-brimmed hat. Then he strayed through the smoke, dropped into the vacant chair at our table, and pulled out cigarettes. The evening was at the period when reserve is thawed. One of us mentioned three Würzburgers to the waiter. The dark-haired young man acknowledged his inclusion in the order by a smile and a nod. I hastened to ask him a question because I wanted to try out a theory I had. Would you mind telling me, I began, whether you are from the fist of E. Rushmore Coglin, bang the table, and I was jarred into silence. Excuse me, said he, that's a question I never like to hear asked. What does it matter where a man is from? Is it fair to judge a man by his post office address? Why, I've seen Kentuckians who hated whiskey, Virginians who weren't descended from Pocahontas, Indianians who hadn't written a novel, Mexicans who didn't wear velvet trousers with silver dollars sewed along the seams, funny Englishmen, spendthrift Yankees, cold-blooded Southerners, narrow-minded Westerners, and New Yorkers who were too busy to stop for an hour on the street to watch a one-armed grocer's clerk do up cranberries in paper bags. Let a man be a man and don't handicap him with the label of any section. Pardon me, I said, but my curiosity was not altogether an idle one. I know the South, and when the band plays Dixie, I like to observe. I have formed the belief that the man who applauds the air with special violence and ostensible sectional loyalty is invariably a native of either Sescos, New Jersey, or the district between Murray Hill Lyceum and the Harlem River, this city. I was about to put my opinions to the test by inquiring of this gentleman when you interrupted with your own larger theory, I must confess. And now the dark-haired man spoke to me and it became evident that his mind also moved along its own set of grooves. "'I should like to be a periwinkle,' said he mysteriously, "'on the top of a valley, and sing to Rallaroo Rallaroo." This was clearly too obscure, so I turned again to Coglin. "'I've been around the world twelve times,' said he. "'I know an Esquimo in Epernavik who sends to Cincinnati for his neckties.' I saw a goat herder in Uruguay who won a prize in a Battle Creek breakfast food puzzle competition. I pay rent on a room in Cairo, Egypt, and another in Yokohama all the year round. I've got slippers waiting for me in a tea house in Shanghai, and I don't have to tell them how to cook my eggs in Rio de Janeiro or Seattle. It's a mighty little old world. What's the use of bragging about being from the north, or the south, or the old manor house in the dale? or Euclid Avenue, Cleveland, or Pikes Peak, or Fairfax County, Virginia, or Hooligans Flats, or any place. It'll be a better world when we quit being fools about some mildewed town or ten acres of swampland just because we happen to be born there. You seem to be a genuine cosmopolite, I said admiringly, but it also seems that you would decry patriotism. A relic of the Stone Age, declared Coglin warmly, we are all brothers, Chinamen, Englishmen, Zulus, Patagonians, and the people in the bend of the Ka River. Some day all this petty pride in one city or state or section or country will be wiped out, and we'll all be citizens of the world as we ought to be. But while you are wandering in foreign lands, I persisted, 
do not your thoughts revert to some spot, some dear and nary a spot, interrupted E. R. Coglin flippantly. The terrestrial globular planetary hunk of matter, slightly flattened at the poles, and known as the Earth, is my abode. I've met a good many object-bound citizens of this country abroad. I've seen men from Chicago sit in a gondola in Venice on a moonlit night and brag about their drainage canal. I've seen a southerner, on being introduced to the King of England, hand that monarch without batting his eyes. The information that his great-aunt on his mother's side was related by marriage to the Perkinses of Charleston. I knew a New Yorker who was kidnapped for ransom by some Afghanistan bandits. His people sent over the money, and he came back to Kabul with the agent. Afghanistan? the native said to him through an interpreter. Well, not so slow, do you think? Oh, I don't know, says he, and he begins to tell them about a cab driver at Sixth Avenue and Broadway. Those ideas don't suit me. I'm not tied down to anything that isn't 8,000 miles in diameter. Just put me down as E. Rushmore Coglin, citizen of the terrestrial sphere. My cosmopolite made a large adieu and left me, for he thought he saw someone through the chatter and smoke whom he knew. So I was left with the would-be periwinkle, who was reduced to Wurzburger without further ability to voice his aspirations to perch, melodious, upon the summit of a valley. I sat reflecting upon my evident cosmopolite and wondering how the poet had managed to miss him. He was my discovery and I believed in him. How was it? The men that breed from them, they traffic up and down, but cling to their city's hem as a child to the mother's gown. Not so E. Rushmore Coglin, with the whole world for his... My meditations were interrupted by a tremendous noise and conflict in another part of the café. I saw above the heads of the seated patrons E. Rushmore Coglin and a stranger to me engaged in terrific battle. They fought between the tables like titans, and glasses crashed, and men caught up their hats and were knocked down, and a brunette screamed, and a blonde began to sing teasing. My cosmopolite was sustaining the pride and reputation of the earth when the waiters closed in on both combatants with their famous flying wedge formation and bore them outside, still resisting. I called McCarthy, one of the French garçons, and asked him the cause of the conflict. The man with the red tie, that was my cosmopolite, said he, got hot on account of things said about the bum sidewalks and water supply of the place he come from by the other guy. Why, said I, bewildered, that man is a citizen of the world, a cosmopolite. He originally from Mattawamkeag, Maine, he said, continued McCarthy, and he wouldn't stand for no knock in the place. End of A Cosmopolite in a Café